my name is Glenn Coggy. I'm chairman of the Labor Front on Facebook. We do these podcasts once in a while. They're called Table Talk. And John Ganan, candidate for president of the International UAW, is taking time out of his busy schedule uh, to come in and talk to us tonight a little bit. And we'll get an update on his campaign and see where it's going. John, thanks for being here. Can you give us an update about where your campaign's going? Okay, okay, thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity, Glenn, to, to come on Labor Front. Uh, yeah, I just kind of quickly like to update some people on some things that have taken place uh, last week. Uh, we, uh, we have received uh, from the president's office that they have made a determination that they do not feel that retirees uh, are eligible to run for an IEB board position. And uh, we have sent our appeal into the president's office in regards to their decision. Uh, and I just kind of like to walk everybody through uh, where we're at with our appeal in regards to what the president's office said of why we are not eligible to run. Uh, First of all, let's go back a little bit to the 1M, 1V, uh, uh, so I can kind of walk into this. The 1M, 1V, we both, uh, most of our members are aware now that was brought about by the corruption uh, by presidents, uh, two presidents, uh, three vice presidents, uh, uh, a regional director out of region five uh, and a number of other people. Six IEB board members were found guilty and nine other individuals uh, from the UAW. Uh, then after that took place, Roy Gamble and the US attorney out of the Department of Justice by the name of Matthew Snyder, they sat down and went through a set of negotiations on how they thought they could reform uh, the UAW and hopefully bring some of the credibility back. Uh, they finally reached the settlement. Uh, what the settlement was, they were going to afford another option uh, to the membership in regards to how IEB board uh, members uh, could be elected. And it was called direct elections, uh, one member, one vote. And uh, then it was flipped over uh, to an attorney <coughs> to put a consent decree together. And in doing that, they incorporated a referendum and it spelled out who would be the qualifying people that would be entitled to vote on either direct elections, 1M, 1V, or the traditional elections that were presented naturally, as we know, with delegates electing the board. Uh, upon that being released, uh, they identified that the any member in good standing, uh, they even mentioned S1 employees or TPTs that are paying union dues, reinstated employees and all union members uh, was the people that would be qualified to vote. So after they got the dates together, uh, they informed us that there'd be a ballot going out and you'd have a certain time, window period to fill out the ballot and send it back. And then that was the process that was gonna take place. They completed that process and come back. Uh, the percentage was right around 64 to 36 in favor of direct elections. Uh, so that was gonna be the new right for the members to decide for the very first time in the history of UAW that one member, one vote would determine how the board's going to get elected. So in doing that, as it moved on, all of a sudden a question come up of would a retiree have a right to run for a board position on the IEB? And that was the question that we researched before we decided, or before I decided to run for board position of president of UAW. We vented out the constitution 
very thoroughly. I made personal calls to people that had the job of interpreting the Constitution. And they said that there was nothing in the Constitution that would prevent you from running for an IEB board position. And that was them explaining that to us. Uh, upon listening to that, we started our campaign. And we moved forward and met with the large groups of retirees. We talked to nationally local unions that we were hoping to support us. And we were getting a very positive response. And then naturally the board come out and made a decision that the uh, retirees would not be eligible to run. The monitor that said that the monitor and the adjudication officer both agreed that the, the, the constitution was silent. It did, it did not have anything in the constitution that forbidden a retired to run. But what they said was due to some public review board hearings, they felt that the language and the phrase they use was arguably ambiguous is what they used. So what they did is they walked away from it. They said, we're gonna to refer to the international president under article 13, section eight for the president to make that interpretation. So they sent it to the president's office, President Ray Curry, shortly after he got it, he came out with an interpretation that stated the following things. He said that there is both international UAW laws and federal laws that inform my conclusion that retirees, while value members of our international union should not be able, be, be eligible to run for the international office and ask the board for their consent of his determination. So that was the that was the second paragraph that he addressed that we would not meet the qualifier. Uh, I have been on staff for 16 years uh, in the UAW Crisis Department and was the assistant director, uh, appointed the assistant director in 1995 after eight years as a service rep. And uh, shortly after I was appointed the top AA in the Crescent Department. Internal UAW laws, I do not know what they are. I never heard of them before in my 16 years on staff. Federal laws, our campaign was not able to respond to federal laws. So we went out and seek legal advice. We wanted to know if we were uh, violating any Department of Labor laws. And if we were, we wanted to know what they were so we could get a clear clarification in regards to which ones they were. We did that. Uh, and what the response we got back was uh, quite amazing. What they said was that permitting candidates of retired members is consistent with the federal law. Contrary to what President Curry said, federal laws do not support his position. And his position was that we were violating federal laws, but he didn't indicate any of the laws. They are saying now that what Curry said in his, in his interpretation is totally wrong. So we kind of wondered exactly what, did, what, what more did we need to know? What the US Department of Labor prohibits is that if you're a criminal, you cannot nationally hold uh, a union position. The main standard for somebody holding that position, it, re it requires that the candidate be a member in good standing. Uh, 
Beyond those restrictions, the Department of Labor disfavors restrictions against retirees. Now that's the Labor Department making them statements. And they go on to say that the Department of Labor states that while it allows unions to prescribe minimum standards for candidacy. Now, that is what the Department of Labor said. And they even went beyond that a little bit for us. Uh, the Constitution has certain provisions in there that says uh, under Section 10 that you have to meet these qualifiers to make sure you're eligible. You cannot be a member of a political party or, or an organization uh, of any government in order to, uh, other than the United States or Canada. It says you cannot be involved in racketeering such as the number of games or bookmaking. It also says you should not attempt to decertify the International Union or the UAW, local unions. And the last one says you cannot have any convictions by a UAW trial board overturned for at least 60 days under Article 10. Now, them are the provisions that says that if you violate any of them, you're not eligible to run. Well, naturally, we didn't violate any of them. We don't have anything in that area whatsoever. So that was Article 10. Well, then we went on farther and farther into the conversation. And uh, it seemed like what Curry was saying to us uh, was not true. He didn't stipulate any federal laws. But we did stipulate laws that favored us for, for running. Now, the American Postal Service has no problem with it, and the American, American Communication Union has no problems with retirees running. And they openly addressed them and showed us who they were and what they were. Now, my question to Mr. Curry is, I don't know where he come up with these decisions, uh, but uh, the moderator and uh, said that that the agreement is silent in regards to retires running for an IEB position. And I'm that, real quick, you know. The, uh, the International Union asked the retirees to vote on how that should work, right? Correct. I mean, they asked for the one member, one vote. They gave retirees voting rights on that. So it makes no sense that they would prevent retirees from running. And your appeal's been filed. I, I understand that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The retirees were totally included in the 1M, 1B vote. And I think everybody, I think, at least we did, such as other candidates, I'm not the only candidate running as a retired for an IEB position. We felt that when come time for nominations and voting, that retires would be totally included in. And you've been uh, in communication with the other, some of the other yeah. candidates running, right? The, the the, section, section six, uh, I mean, Article 6, Section 19, this is a, a statement that's in the Constitution. And uh, I, I, I don't quite understand how the board is supporting this. It says, all members in good standing who is retired shall be entitled to a retiree membership status which without being required to pay membership dues during the period of such retirement shall entitle her or him to all the privileges of a membership. Reading that, I don't think there's anything ambiguous about that statement. And then it goes on to say that the following 
sections and articles what retires are not allowed to participate in. And it goes on to section 19, article 19, article 45, and article 50. And what them three section articles are, one is they cannot vote on a national agreement. The other, they can't run for, or they can't vote on stewards and committeemen's. And the last one is Article 51 and 5 in the article says you can't, the retirees do not have a right to vote on a strike vote, and they do not have a right to vote on canceling a strike vote. That is the only exceptions they have put in this Constitution that retirees do not have a right to participate in. The only. So what Mr. Curry said is not true. So then Mr. Curry wrote in his letter that in order to be able or qualify, he says that you have to be able to be able to handle grievances and have collective bargaining. Now, I don't want to be what you call arrogant about this. Mr. Curry, President Curry, was a financial secretary at his local unit. And in 19, in, in, in 2020, John Ganan went to local 5285, which is Ray Curry's home plant. Ray Curry, I met him at that time. He was the Secretary of Treasury, and I did the national agreement for Freightliner. And when we got done with the agreement, we we're on a four day strike, and the contract got ratified 97.5. Now, when you talk about grievances, I was a I was an elected rep in my plant for 13 years, and I was on staff for 16 years. Any chief steward knows that he is going to be writing a number of grievances when he's the chief steward. Hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them as a two-term steward. And when you become committeeman and the chairman, which I was, your job is to settle grievances. And when you're afforded an opportunity to come to the national department, 95% of the grievances that come to the national department basically are mostly discharges. So Mr. Curry doesn't have to say that John Ganan is not qualified to handle grievances. I would say in my eight years as a servicing rep, I had eight plants with approximately 18,000 people. I would say we probably get 1% of that 18,000 would be grievances that come to the appeal board of people being discharged. In over eight years, I have probably handled over 1,400 discharges as a servicing rep in the Crescent Department, not counting the ones that you handled when you're in the plant elected on the floor. So to say that I'm not qualified, uh, I don't quite understand that. Mr. Our President Curry was a secretary, I mean, a financial secretary. They don't write grievances and they don't handle grievances and they don't sit on bargaining committees. So maybe the question isn't whether or not I was qualified. Maybe the question is, is President Curry qualified? But that's what he threw in our face to a retiree. Now, the other retired person that's running has outstanding qualities, too, in regards to grievances and negotiations. Uh, I won't say anything bad about it. He knows how to negotiate. He knows how to settle grievances. Uh, but for them to say that, I thought was very disrespectful. So after Mr. Our President Curry made those statements. We reviewed the letter and we're saying, what are we not qualified for? The federal law says we have a right to run. 
the qualifiers of not handling grievances or collecting bargaining is not true because we have. I've done 11 national agreements. 11 national agreements and 12 local seniority supplements. That's 20 something negotiations that I've been in that Mr. Curry says I'm not able to qualify under collective bargaining. That's not true about retirees. We are retirees that in all fairness was involved in many negotiations when we were on staff. The 1999 agreement, for example. Unfortunately, the death of my vice president that had a massive heart attack, I had to, can you still see me? Yeah, I see you. Okay. Uh, I had to take the responsibilities of not only being the top A, but acting vice president. That agreement was, I think, one of the better agreements that was ever negotiated in the history of UAW. We had four GWIs. We had defined pensions for everybody. We had insurance for everybody. We had improvements in COLA. We increased future retirement for pensions by $435. And we also addressed current retires with the enhanced inflationary rate every year of the agreement and a Christmas bonus. Now that's not, that's not easy to do, uh, but that's where we were. Uh, and so I say to the board, what happened after that agreement? 2003 agreement, 2007 agreement, we incorporated two tier, we got no GWIs. Then we went into 2009 and took a concessionary agreement that uh, was totally unbelievable. And then it never has changed. Our retirees have not received a dime since 2011. And in 10-11, they only received $10. We have totally forgot retirees. We have two tiers now in this corporation that is just, it's just almost an embarrassment of whether they're paying them. S1 employees coming in at $15.78. We have tiers of $16, $17, eight years before you get to the traditional wage. I don't know how they survive. In today's world, we got an inflationary rate uh, of eight or eight five or higher. Only thing I'm saying is, and I say this to all of the membership and to retirees, we didn't run or I didn't plan on running for this job except for one reason, to try to reinstore the credibility of this union back. That is why I'm running. There's no benefit to me. I love my job when I was on staff. I, I, I love my job negotiating and I love my job representing people. And I feel like I did a good job doing it. I didn't know what happened to it when I walked out the door. I left in 2002. Uh, it used to be proud to be a UAW member. It used to be proud to negotiate a contract when they went back and could tell their family exactly what we extracted across the bargaining table for their family. That's not there no more. I can only say this to the membership, and I say it from my heart. We have an opportunity to change this union. We got to lift this union up again. 
This union needs to come out of this abyss and created by a few unscrupulous international leaders. Did I ever think we'd have two presidents that would be represent this union that are in prison right now? Three vice presidents that did the same thing? A regional director? Six board members in prison? We are scarred right now to the public's eyes. Organizing drives are dead in the water. I don't know how you organize when this happened. The monitor said that the agreement was silent. The agreement, the Constitution says, the UAW Constitution is the highest law of this union. You do not have a right to interpret things that are not in the Constitution. The delegates are the only ones. They are the only ones that can decide how this union is run, and they do that when they're at the Constitution. They are the highest power in this union, and that is at the convention. Now that power is taken away from one convention to the other. The International Board is in charge. But when you're at the convention, you are the power. You decide whether we do let a retire run or we don't. And if you feel you don't want me to run, then I can understand it. I'll walk away and it'll be the end of it. But the group that I got together, the team is a very, very strong and dedicated team. And they know how to negotiate. We didn't just pick fly by nights. We picked some very talented people and hopefully would have an opportunity to go back to the table and hopefully regain the credibility of the union. So John, what we need, what you're asking, is for everybody that is interested in the UAW to run for delegate, to jump in, run for delegate. But if the retirees are good enough to support the one member, one vote, and help out with that, then they're good enough to run for a national leadership of this union. And we need the delegates to support that cause. So. Um, John, I appreciate you coming on. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but the UAWD caucus has put out uh, the resolution pack. Have you had a chance to look over that? I got I got the package. I have not had a chance to look at it, but uh, go ahead and finish up what you want to say. No, I was going to see what your thoughts were. I mean, there's some res there's resolutions in there. I, I believe personally, and this is just my opinion, not a candidate for anything. But I believe there's resolutions in there that are good, that will really be a big benefit to the UAW. But I was wanting to get your opinion on it as well. Okay, well, far away. Well, I don't have it in front of me. No, I do. Okay, you already said that you, you already mentioned the tiers and um, you're opposed to the multi-tier system and the eight year to pay increases. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's my, go ahead. Well, my answer to that, uh, that 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 question comes up almost any time you talk uh, to a group of UAW workers because uh, sixty to sixty five percent of the employment levels in our plants now are almost uh, tier workers. I mean, you can't avoid that not coming up. My answer to it is, and it it will be, it's. It's got to be parity for all. Right. Uh, uh, I've said this before. It's, it, it's, it, you cannot have a workforce where one guy on one side of the line is making $30 and something and the other one's making $16 or $17 or whatever, tier, whatever step of the tier he's in. Uh, that, is not, that is not who the UAW is or was. Uh, see, the thing about, let me say this, I'll try to shorten this up pretty much. 
every company maybe, and I don't know for sure, I'm not one to judge that, will probably run into a recession at one time or the other in an industry. And as older, older retires, uh, we, we can remember some of them. I mean, I come out of Chrysler in 1979 and I, 80, we know what happened there. We had to go to the government and make a lobby for a loan guarantee. Doug Frazier was the president at that time. We took a concessionary agreement. But the key to it was when the company got back on their feet, we got back what we gave up. You can't go into a concessionary agreement in 2009 and 14 years later and not get any of it back. What have we extracted back out of the concessionary agreement in 2009 today? We gave up COLA. We gave up insurance for new hires. We gave up a defined pension. We gave up overtime premium pay after eight hours. We took away relief time from assembly. We did not negotiate one penny for future retires or current retires. You can't live in that world. That's been 12, 14 years ago, the time we get to the table. Not nothing come back. We got people living or earning wages now. Uh, I don't know how they survive with the inflation rate they are, what gas is, what they say on, I heard on TV two or three weeks ago, the average income for groceries, utility, gas to live is up $300 more a month. How does a person on a two-tier wage survive? Right. And not to mention the fact that uh, the big three have made at or near record profits quite a few years since that 2009 contract. So they're making record profits and they're just giving us the crumbs. And uh, so that, that was number one. There's eight, eight questions or eight resolutions on here. Uh, number two is to increase strike pay from uh, an amendment, amendment to Article 50. And they want to increase it from 275 to 400. I totally agree with that. Yeah, how, I, how could you not? Um, no, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's a, it's a good uh, resolution, and I'll be one of the first that would support that. Great. Let me, let me just say this, and I won't belabor it too much. Uh, I don't know what it's going to take at the bargaining table. I mean, we don't even know if we'll have an opportunity to be there. We're hoping we will be. We think that we can address this and we think we know how to get some of it done or we wouldn't be running for this job. But sometimes things get very ugly in negotiations. I mean, you know what happened uh, in 2019. I don't have to tell you, you're from General Motors. It took a 40 day strike. Uh, and I don't know exactly what you got more when you come back. Uh, that's that I wasn't present or had the details of it there. But if you're going to take a company on, you got to be able to have the strength of a membership with you, or you will not win. Every time you go into a set of negotiations, there's always big hitters at the table that you hope to extract. It could be pensions, it could be COLA, it could be GWIs, it could be many, many things. Never have I ever been involved in a negotiations of the upcoming negotiations that had so many big items that have to be taken care of. And I've been in 11 of them. I mean, Normally you go in and if there's one big hitter that you're fortunate enough to get out of that negotiations, that's normally a big plus. I mean, like pensions, if you get pensions. When we got COLA, that was big. When we got the 30 and up, that was big. I mean, the number of ongoing things that you just keep getting from the company progressively, hopefully a year, I mean, contract after contract. We have not touched any of that since 2009. 
we have not extracted one big thing out of what we gave up in the last 2011, 2015, and 2019. Nothing. We did get the Easter Monday back, I think, if I'm, a, if I'm correct, is the only thing I know. That's a crumb. That's what we got back is a crumb. That's, that's less than a crumb. Yes, it is. That is less than a crumb. That's less than a crumb. So they also want to uh, have a sustainable strike fund amendment to Article 16. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I want to comment on this. I don't, uh, I, I think I, I believe what they're trying to say. I don't, they want to keep it in house. Uh, what, what you earn, I guess, from the strike fund, et cetera, et cetera, to maintain or sustain the, uh, the fund uh, by not using the interest money or whatever else, other places. Uh, the, the only answer to that I have would be is, uh, I, uh, I would have to review the finances before I make that decision. Right. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't actually know um, all the finances that are going on, and I, 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 it'd be hard for me to answer that one way or the other. I don't know. It's probably a very. It's probably. I know the intent of it, and it very well could be what you need to do. But I'd have to review that before I could comment on that. Right. Right. So number four is a resolution for aggressive worker-led new organizing in electric vehicles. Okay. Well. Let me say this about the EV. Uh, I, uh, I'm a different type person uh, than most people when it comes to uh, something of this magnitude. This is going to be extremely huge in a corporation. Uh, Organizing is a great tool. I don't know how we stand right now in regards to organizing anything. Our reputation has really been tarnished. And hopefully in the 23 negotiations, we can regain some of our integrity and our credibility and our reputation. Right. Me, I'm a player that believes something this big has to be done at a bargaining table. I mean, that's what I believe. Right. Uh, most of the time when I got involved in work going someplace else, uh, I took it on at a bargaining table and prepared myself for it. Uh, organizing, you go to Tennessee, you go to Alabama, let's don't bullshit nobody. We're in trouble when we go there. You've seen what the Corkers and the Shelbys do in Alabama and Tennessee. They go out of the way to make sure the union gets destroyed and never gets organized. And you spend millions and millions of dollars and we don't come out with the results that we want. I think that issue has to be taken up at the bargaining table. And I think you've got to apply the pressure there. Because uh, uh, I don't have a lot of faith in uh, uh, trying to organize plants in the South to what we call livable wages, to credible wages. You know what they'll try to do there. If we're going 1578 uh, under the big th under the big three contract now, I, I don't even want to think about what it might be down in Tennessee and Alabama. So my, my answer to that is uh, I, 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 I probably have a different agenda on that one. I, I would not take, uh, my priority is not organized and my priority would be negotiated. That's me. All right. Yeah, I, I don't see any other way around it. So I 100% agree. Uh, let's see, the next resolution is five ranked choice voting and six retiree eligibility. You've pretty much covered them um, number seven, International Executive Board, salary transparency. Did you say seven? 
Yeah, because you've okay. already talked about five and six earlier in the yeah, in the well, conversation. we don't we don't want to miss six. <laughs> right, right. I mean, if you want to cover, we don't want to miss me. six because what we're asking what we're asking on six is actually for the delegates to afford to retire as an opportunity to run. That's all right. we're asking for. Right. You know, think about what we're saying. We have five hundred eighty thousand retirees. We're asking for the retirees to have an opportunity for a representative. Right. We ain't asking for somebody that's never been at the bargaining table. We ain't asking for somebody that's going to make a fool out of himself. We're asking for somebody that's been at the table 11 times on a national negotiations and another retired that has as much experience as I do. And I can't say nothing bad about him. That's all right. we're asking for. Right. And why is the board afraid of it? You know the answer to that already. So. Oh, 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 I'm saying is, uh, that gets my feathers a little ruffled, and I apologize for that. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was just going to uh, tell you, you don't have to hold back your passion on this. <laughs> okay, I, well, I appreciate that. No, I you mean, well. it's, it's just it just comes it just comes deep inside when they tell me that a retiree cannot run for an IEB position, and the guy that's there now does not have the qualifications of the other of retiree that wants to run. Right. And Try that's to, not being disrespectful to the president of the UAW. It's being factual. I'm just telling the truth. John, the thing is that when they, this union was built on the backs of the retirees. Well, we're active we've, in, always, we've always said that, but I'm starting to wonder if that's true. <laughs> they, still had, they, they forgot us an awful lot here lately. So. There's still enough of us that believe that, and hopefully we get it set up the way that it should be, where there is representation for the retirees. And, and that would only be the fairest thing to do. Um, looking at resolution number eight, I believe, no, number seven, salary transparency, amendment to article 11. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that one or not. I, 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 uh... I have not. Is that the one about, I just briefly, is that the one about, the, oh, no, salary transparency? No, I, I have not. I yeah. have not looked at that one. Uh, there was yeah. one, and, and I, I don't know if I bypassed it. There was one about, uh, oh, this is it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the one I'm that I was going to read about. Uh, I don't disagree with anything they said. I ain't in the game for money anyway. I don't give a damn what they pay for a salary. You yeah. know what I mean? Uh, right. My it's, salary, it's... my salary, my pension for the UAW that I receive now as an international representative will be withdrawn. I will not be able to draw. I will not be able to draw it if I want. Huh? So it doesn't matter to me. It this game is not about money. Apparently, it was for Gary Jones and some other people, but it's not for me. Right. I don't need it. I'm 78 years old. All right, I'll take it back. I had a birthday this month. I'm 79 years old. Uh, I have made my life what it is today. Uh, it's not about money. Believe it or not, people that know me know why I'm doing this. And, I, and I'll say this, uh, as I said before, we See, there's one thing you learn about this job. and it, it does have some rewards. But let me tell you what one of them is, and I'll tell, tell you real quick. You go to an election negotiations, wherever it is, and you conclude that negotiations, and you close it out, and you go in front of that membership, and they give you a standing ovation. When you're done, and they walk up on the stage and they got water in their eyes because you did a good job. That's all the rewards I need. No more. And that's what this job's about. And anybody who's doing it for any other reason is doing it the wrong way. That's all you need. They'll reward you. There's no better high that you can get in your life than to go in front of 3,000 people and get a standing ovation for you doing a job well done. 
That's what this job's about. I agree. And I agree. we want an opportunity to be able to do that again. Do me. we know that we can do it for sure? No, we do not. We don't know what kind of attitude this company's going to have if I showed up at a bargaining table. Nobody can make that prediction. Like, there's one thing you'll never hear out of me. And it's been asked a hundred times to me. Can you get this? Can you get that? Can you get... I don't know that. No negotiator that sits at a bargaining table before he goes in knows what he can extract from a corporation. You just don't know. But I know one thing. We go in prepared and we know how to confront a company, especially one that hasn't give shit to anybody in the last 14 years. I do know how to do that. And my hope is that we can make, that we can make this company realize what they owe this membership. And that's what we're about. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. Hopefully we do, John. So the last resolution that they had is a resolution on fighting discrimination to build a strong and unified UAW. Well, I am always very strongly on that. That always needs improvement. So I'm in fully support of any resolution that builds a stronger and unified UAW. John, I sure appreciate you taking time to come on. And not just that, I, you know, I've known you for a few months. I thank you for getting back in the fight. Uh, your fighting spirit is there. Nobody can deny that. Um, we just need people to turn out. We need delegates, people to run for delegate, and then support the um, retirees running. Uh, we owe it to you. And okay, just I one quick one quick closure, and then I'll shut up and let you have dinner right. and visit with your family. All right. <laughs> and, and there's something that bothers me a little bit, and I, I just want to say it because if I don't, I'll regret it. My wife will look at me and say, you forgot what you said you were going to talk about. She'll probably say I'm getting seen out. <laughs> so I don't want her saying that. Uh, the monitor that turned this over for the president of the UAW to make a decision on whether a retiree could run or not. I've been in this business for a while, 30 years as a, rep, as a union representative, 37 years before I retired. I have never seen anybody that could make a decision like that, flip it to the person that is involved in the election. And all he did was one thing, freeze us out. The labor, the Department of Labor says that the incumbent cannot paralyze a candidate for running for that office. And that's what he's done with us. What did he, what did the monitor actually think that President Curry was going to say? Did he think he was going to say, well, bring John Ganano? Bring that other retiree on too. No, he wasn't going to say that. He knew he wasn't going to say that. He knew he was going to deny it. The Constitution does not say that we do not have a right to run. It is silent, which gives us the right. It identifies in the Constitution what we don't have a right to do is retire. And that is not one of the issues. So making this interpretation is the most biased thing. And if this is not a conflict of interest, I have never seen one in my life. The man that is running for the job is going to make a decision on anybody else that wants to run for the job. His first decision is eliminate him. I got to ask you this as UAW members, is that democracy? Is ask yourself that question, is that democracy? Is that giving the membership the right to select who they want to lead them in the 2023 negotiations and be president of the UAW? Think about that. That's all I got to say. And I appreciate being on tonight, Lynn. 
And uh, uh, I just want to say to all members, God bless you and wish you the best. And uh, we're going to keep on campaigning. We are not going to quit. We are begging and hoping that we get delegates to the convention that will overturn this board's decision of turning their back on retirees and the active workers. And that's what we're hoping for. So thank you, Glenn. I appreciate it very much. John, that's a great way to close out. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, this is Table Talk. Everybody have a good night. Be safe.